alaikum and welcome back from the break. You're tuned into Women's AM live from London and on the panel today we have sisters Shaheen Zainab and Sultana Parvin who is a non-fiction writer and blogger. Jazakum al for joining us this morning. It's great to have you here. So I'd like to ask you, given that you write extensively, um, what is your favourite topic to write about? Okay, that's a good question. I've been thinking about what, what has been my... I've, I've written lots of different things, but I think if I were to sum it up in one word, it would have to be about the human disposition. I know that sounds like really grandiose and big and deep, <laughs> but I think what I mean by that is what makes human beings tick, because I, because I think that most human beings, Muslim, non-Muslim, um, we have the same needs, we have the same wants and desires, um, the things that we want from life, the things that we want for our children, um, you know, f the things that women want, men want, and I'm keenly interested in those things. And I just wanted to tap into that kind of psychology of human mm. beings and what makes them tick. Um, and the decisions, therefore, they make are based upon what makes them tick. So I think that that's probably where I, I love looking into that, studying mm. it, researching it, reading about it, and then writing about it as well, alhamdulillah. It's just to say the human being is, is a whole bag of mystery, really, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. There's so, much, there's so much to us, and, and yeah. it's, it's the thing where you can sort of reflect on how, yes. how we behave and how we think. So yes. much, that's quite interesting, mashallah. What about you, Sister Shaheen? You've got I a question. question. Okay. Um, what inspires you to write? Oh, what inspires me? Everything mm. actually inspires me. I know it sounds really... <laughs> cliche, <laughs> but I think everything inspires me. I think sometimes um, it can be personal things that inspire me that are going on in my own personal life, but sometimes looking at world events inspire me. So I can look sometimes at things that go on in the world and it, uh, it can you know, set a chain of um, you know, emotions and thoughts running in my head and then mm. I feel like I need to write about that thing now, otherwise I'll lose it. And I know that other people who write say similar types of things that sometimes if you don't capture what you want to write sometimes you don't manage to you you get writer's block or it just won't come mm. out right yeah, so when you're feeling it i know when, when you're, you're feeling, feeling something it, yeah. at that point if you don't get it down yeah. on paper i mean i wrote something you can't capture the same thing i wrote later. something about uh, about six months ago which i wrote in one long train and it was it turned out to be seven pages long wow. in one go and i know that sounds like a lot but after i read it i realized that i had been bottling up all these thoughts about this topic mm. for so long and I needed to just get them down on paper and it's actually s still not even finished wow. so I've got little bits that I still need to but that's kind of the way the process happens for me it may happen differently for other people but I'm just inspired by everything mostly human beings and human emotion and pain and all of those kind of I things I think we have to bring the sister back to read that train of thought <laughs> don't we? shut up last seven pages long why no, not seven pages. <laughs> 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 just like I'm for that right let's talk about vampires and werewolves in today's her views It seems in recent years the fantasy world of vampires, werewolves, castles and the Middle Ages has taken root amongst young people with films, books and computer games having created an alternate world for our youth to retreat to and be entertained by. But this isn't a new phenomenon or even one which only affects the youth. The fantasy genre has always been enjoyed by young and old for centuries. But as Muslims, how should we view the entertainment of fantasy stories and what does Islam have to say about this topic you can join in the conversation by calling in the number is on the screen what do you think about today's topic and we'd love to know what you have to say inshallah so I'm gonna fire away and start with you sister Sultana okay. we see a whole array of different fantasy stories we've got Harry Potter yeah. Pirates of the Caribbean yeah. the Hobbit Narnia and the list goes on yeah. it isn't a new invention no. but isn't it just a continuation of a historical past um, yes and no so I think yes, because there's always going to be stories. There's always going to be the realms of things which are fictional in stories, so made up worlds, um, you know, unrealistic kind of places that don't exist, people that don't exist. So that's, that, that's pretty much, um, you know, fiction. But when we talk about fantasy, we're talking about a specific type of thing that has evolved, I think, more, more recently, and the consequences of that. So we spoke about the vampire kind of culture that has arisen over the past five or six years, and the kind of cult following that that has got and I think what's happened is is fantasy what it basically does is this is a mechanism to escape reality and um, I was reading a paper about um, the effects of the fantasy fiction literature on young people and they were talking about how between the ages of 12 and 18 is the time where people have to develop a healthy um, view towards life they you know healthy way yeah. of living and built you know building their own sense of themselves and 
in a context where you have a wider celebrity culture, which is pretty much fantasy, and it's based upon unreality where a few people live that in a culture which is secularized where people are given the choice whether to believe in god or not you have lots of uncertainty there's a lot of uncertainty floating around and people see that as something good that you mm -hmm. have uncertainty because you can then just decide what you want to be but in that context then you have things such as the fantasy culture of vampires and werewolves mm -hmm. and all of that kind of thing where it's not considered um, something evil or weird anymore. Um, in the vampire culture, the vampire kind of stories now, they are considered the heroes. The vampires are considered the heroes, the blood-sucking people who are killing off the bad vampires. You have yeah. good vampires and bad vampires. And what does that do? That teaches you all about, you know, you are getting your moral compass from a lot of these ideas, such as this idea that you can never die, that you can kill, um, that you can fall in love with vampires and become a vampire, you know, all of that mm. kind of thing. Now, what does that then do to the psychology of young people who are following that? And that's really the question. What's it doing to their psychology? Well, it's quite interesting that you, you mentioned about, you know, the fact that this is something that has always been around. Yeah. I mean, this concept of good and evil. I remember the stories that many of us were sort of brought upon, whether it was, you know, Red Riding Hood and yeah. whatnot. A lot of them were based on fantasy. And what yeah. we're seeing today is that fantasy is no longer really a separate genre. Mm. It has become part and parcel of our lifestyle, our way of thinking as yes. well. And I think that's where the deep rooted effects kind of come in, how the, the kind of hold that fantasy has over our life that yes. you know our lifestyle is transformed by it and it becomes a fantasy as well yeah. um sister can you explain to us what are the most recent aspects of this type of, of the entertainment of fantasy like you said it's, it's a huge industry at the moment and i think it kind of spans into more things than just vampires and werewolves i think mm. it's, just, it's a, you know it's good to kind of look into all these different areas and i think there's lots of shades of this issue as well um not to kind of paint everything in the same same way so you have uh the novels twilight saga very famous mm. uh the host uh hunger games even can fall into this ca category um harry potter you know that yeah. can fall into that category as well uh computer games um that's something that okay is for bo both boys and girls but normally it's for, for the guys um, that they're more so into yeah. these kind of things so you know, there's a boy market and a girl market so if you split these two things up they yeah. basically focus on dealing with certain diff different issues so when you've got the girl market it's basically about having this very idealized hyper um, kind of version of a romantic yes. relationship mm. and the whole thing that, that this revolves around is um, about fi finding happiness and a purpose through that love. That as soon as you kind of get that kind of love in your life, then that means that you've kind of, that's it, you've attained the, the highest and the, the most important thing. So it's kind of creating this kind of vision for, for, for that kind of thing and that this is true happiness mm. as well. For the boys, it's more about, you know, dark souls and uh, game and um, uh, Lord of the Rings. Mm. So these kind of things are more about boys being able to, or young men or older men or whatever, um, being able to kind of get into these games and feel like they're accomplishing something by going through, you yeah. know, these different, dealing with these different things that, you know, they're able to, you know, dominate others and conquer people and basically deal with this whole if issue of good and bad as well. Yeah. This is still a thread that goes through mm. a lot of these games that mm. you are, you know, championing the rights of people who need you, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. But they're actually, like you were saying, I'll we'll discuss it a bit more, I guess, that um, the, the the people who write these games are trying to change that idea of what is good and bad yeah. um, mm. and all this kind of stuff and the, sometimes the protagonists where in our time they would normally be um, you know the good guy there's there's games that they've made where you are the bad guy yeah and your and your objective wow. is to fight the good people yeah. you know that kind of so thing kind but of you don't know that's head, happening it? you know yeah. once upon a time fantasy Absolutely. was very sort of black and white good and evil that's but it. now yeah. the dynamics of that have changed which is quite interesting as Absolutely. well but you know but just want to th add one other element there are films that so for example the hunger game which focus on uh justice and oppression yeah so that's yeah. actually a really good point as well that each thing, each medium, each film, each game is very unique in its own take. It has to so be taken it's on its by its absolutely. own merit, isn't it? Yeah. It's quite interesting as well. Sopana, uh, so Shahina, I mean, so Pana, it, this, this concept of fantasy is something that entices young and old, um, male and female. But why is it that um, young and old people are kind of drawn to, these, to this particular genre in all its different forms. I mean, besides the fact that people might want to attain something that they feel that, they, that it's not within their reach in reality, what other reasons for which people are drawn to the genre? Well, 
I mean, I think back to my childhood, and I used to watch things like Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and I had a big thing for fairy tales, which is fun. It was escapism. You can lo learn a lot of moral yeah. things from it, good things yeah. from it. Yeah. And so often, especially at school, they use it to teach you good moral values yeah. through some yeah. of the stories, which is fine. But the d dangerous thing, especially even, it's not just the kids, it's the adults. And the kind of things, I'm not talking about just this vampire kind of things, even what Sister Zena mentioned about video games for men. For me, that sticks in my mind a lot because I've seen the impact of it, and you see it in the news. Some of these games, like the protagonist, like um, Sister was saying, it's not, he's not even a good person, it's actually the evil character, and this person is allowed to play out that evil character. But what does it say about that person and their thinking in the first place? The fact that even if it's not real, they want to giving them the opportunity to live out their fantasies in the video games. And some of that, I'm not even going to go into some of the aspects that mm -hmm. these games inv um, involve. Something that you wouldn't advocate in real life is okay to do in games and what you've seen the result of this is you've seen it on news kids going out and playing out those fantasies for real a lot of these guys who've gone out shooting people have actually said they just wanted to see what it feels like for real because the fun of it doing it for in a, in a game at some point you lose it because it's like anything when you have enough of something you want more you want to take it further mm. and at some point the game becomes boring because it's not real, so you, you, you know the buzz that it gives you, you go and get it out, get it somewhere else. And I know there's the argument, well, it's not the fault of the game, it's not the fault of the stories. Um, actually, you've got to look into the, you know, what responsibility you have in terms of in a society where youth are so depressed, so unhappy, so many issues, so much gaps in terms of answering the questions about their life, their death, mm -hmm. etc. Then you get a group of people who get drawn into this kind of thing, lonely, and, and especially in... A, I mean, like I was saying, the, the, the kids, you know, not having a purpose in life yeah. and, you know, looking for that buzz, looking for that escape. At some point, they will take it out into the street and we've seen the fruits of that. Definitely. What do you think about this, sister? I think it's a really important point because I think what's now happened is uh, equally when you have, um, I mean, the report that I was reading, it was talking about that for young teens especially, most of their life, like adults as well, their lives can be depressing, lonely, stressful, you know, all of the things that most human beings yeah. have to pretty much on a day-to-day -day, you know day-to-day -day reality deal with and what happens is is if you don't have a defined way of looking at the purpose of your life like what is the purpose of my life why am I here what am I here to do and you take can take joy from having some kind of belief system which gives you a sense of purpose a sense of belonging mm -hmm. um, what then happens is um, the boundaries that these fantasy games and you know genres uh, push um, you will want to push those sa same boundaries in your own life. Yeah. And that's reflective of the fact that um, uh, this paper talked about some of these children, they look at some of these characters, they, they look at fantasy as realistic fiction, meaning that, that, that it's attainable. I can be like this character yeah. in this fantasy novel. So I can also be a vampire. If I want to drink blood, it's going to make me feel super powerful. Mm. And I know that sounds completely out of the realms of reality, but there are kids who then do play on that and want to undertake that kind of a thinking because it makes them feel powerful, it gives them an identity, it gives them a moral compass. And this is the other thing that it, it basically becomes a defining point of you bad, how they view right and wrong. So if you normalise that kind of violence, what is it teaching our kids? It's teaching them that that kind of violence is okay because you are the good guy, because you are the protagonist, you are the person who's in the you seat. You set your moral compass in, in yes. a sense, isn't it? It's quite interesting that you mentioned about the concept of boundaries, because in, within reality, we have boundaries. There's yes. certain things we cannot do that maybe we want to do, or yes. certain things that we cannot have that we do want. Mm. And what fantasy does is, as, it, as you said, it shifts those boundaries. Yes. So you, in a sense, you are the control of your own destiny yes. to such a degree that anything can happen and anything's possible. And the scary Shira. thing is that these boundaries are getting pushed with every mm. new film that comes out, with every new game that comes out. Mm. It's being pushed and pushed and pushed to the point that there are no boundaries. But I think that that's pretty much reflective of the fact that its basis for where these games and fantasies are born out of is secularism. Mm. And secularism teaches us that you basically decide what the purpose of your life is. And that's is. why they sell so well a lot right. of these computer games, right. isn't it? Right, right. And it, that's coupled yeah. with obviously a culture of capitalism which is money making. So mm. obviously the big industries will make tons of money from having a whole vampire series and making films and what have you mm. but the impact that that has on young minds the impact that it has on the innocent is what they're not then concerned about the impact that that might m might make somebody who's a bit of a loner who doesn't have a sense of purpose then why then he may want to um, go out and you know shoot all his classmates in mm. uh, as has happened yeah. um, and then they look into this 
kids' history and what he's been watching and what he's... And they see that yeah. they're very heavily involved in this kind of fantasy lifestyle. And what about adults?